You're listening to Brain Buster Radio. Hey, yo, Josh, let me get a little bit of reverb. Yeah. J. Will. Yeah, I'm about that lifestyle. I talk green work, repping it all over. It's right on the T-shirt. Fan for a lifetime. Yeah, that's a long pass. Figure I would show some love right on the podcast. Turn this up loud and make sure you don't do nothing else. Cause if you're listening to us, then you're improving your health. My name is Jay Will. Welcome to the show, yeah. Wrestle, flow, 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 yeah. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to Wrestling Reverb. I am Josh, and I have just realized the last three or four weeks that I ha- I now do this thing when I open up Reverb of going, what is going on? And I don't know why. Kevin, have you noticed that I do that now? I guess that's just our intro now. Yeah, I thought you did it on purpose. It, oh. I, thought, I think it's good to have a consistent intro. <laughs> well, there's nothing really consistent about this show, really. We're always all over the place, so I guess if anything's consistent, it's good to be the intro. But it's not something I really planned. I, I just, it's just, I don't know, maybe it just comes naturally out now like that. Huh, who knows? Yeah, people, uh, people know what they're getting into when they hear, what is going on, everybody? Yeah, see? Even, even, it, see, we both, we both have the same... It's just like the thing now. I, you watch next week, I won't do it. You watch, it just will not happen next week. And I'll be like, ah, oh, shit. Oh, there goes that. But anyway, anyway um, it's, it's, so we're recording this on a Wednesday night, my time, which means that it's Wednesday morning in Kevin land. And Kevin has legitimately just woke up and was like, fuck it. Let's just record right now. He's, I don't think you haven't had breakfast. You've had nothing. You're just, this is the first thing of your day. Yeah, well, I don't really eat breakfast, so... Uh, let's um, unpack that. Uh, back up here. Let's unpack that. Because they do say breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Tell me why you're not eating breakfast. Because I make my own rules, Josh. I don't listen to, to the uh, to the doctors and to the health clinic, the clinicians and uh, the, the so-called experts that tell me breakfast is the most important meal of the day. I'm a guy who eats lunch, dinner, and a midnight snack... And those yeah, are my three meals of the day. Can't hate that. I'm all about a snack at, at like midnight snacks. Snacks in bed. Is there really anything better than a snack in bed? My God. No. Whew. No, there's not. There really isn't. I, I I love just you know laying in bed, curled up, cozy, nice and warm under the covers with Ooh. like a nice like a bag of chips. Oh or, yes, oh. you're speaking my language. You are speaking my language, and the, as you know, my language is. It's kind of batshit crazy. I mean, there's things I say that I'm like, I don't know what just came out of my mouth, especially with the, the way I say things. But um, man, a bag of chips in bed while you're watching something on Netflix, sign me the oh. fuck up. Sign me the fuck up. I did that this weekend. I did that with 13 Reasons Why this weekend. I mean, I just binged the crap out of that and ate a lot of junk food, which I'm definitely not complaining about. No, it sounds like a pretty sweet deal. Mm, it was a good weekend. I'm not going to lie. It was a dang good weekend. Other than, of course, Summer Stream, which was a raging success. We we did Summer Stream with, with Brain Buster Radio this week over on Brain Buster TV on Twitch this past weekend. It was wonderful. We made our goal of over $250 to donate to the two wonderful charities that everyone kind of knows the story. But um, it was just... It was just amazing. I was able to be the kind of... I closed out the, sh- the last couple of hours of the stream and I was able to be a part of the moment when we hit our goal. It was Smark to Death. So everyone obviously knows Smark to Death in the wrestling community on the uh, Twitters. But yes, they got us to our goal and it was just like, ah, what a moment. What a cool, like, we did that eight-hour stream and we mm, we nailed it home. It was a lot of fun. Um, for everyone that watched any part of the stream or just donated or just supported in some way, big thank you. I know that uh, everyone involved in Brain Buster Radio, uh, you know, really relating to the people that kind of were in charge of Summer Stream, which was Queen and Wilf. So I know that they would be, they're very thankful as well. But on behalf of everyone at Brain Buster Radio, it was a success. And we're going to do more stuff like that. So just... Stay tuned for more stuff, because we had a lot of fun with that. 
Now, Kev, this weekend is a pretty big weekend in wrestling. We've got All Out. We've got uh, NXT UK TakeOver. We've got um, New Japan Royal Quest. There's a lot of good stuff happening this week, uh, this weekend in the wrestling world. Now, obviously, we're going to be... Well, I'm assuming, Kev, I hate to assume, but I'm assuming that you'll be watching All Out. I will. I mean, I'm gonna try to watch everything. Obviously, well, yeah. not all at the same time because that would be weird. But <laughs> it would be time bending. But uh, I'm gonna try to watch everything. But I think my main priority, just because, well, I mean, I'll be able to watch uh, Takeover at, at its on its, on its own time because it's earlier in the day. Yeah. And then at night, I'm going to have to make a choice between All Out and Royal Quest. Actually, no, I'm not, because Royal Quest isn't streaming live on New Japan World. It's not going to be on there until a couple days later. Oh. So actually, my decision's, been made, my decision's been made for me. All Out it is. All Out. I guess, uh, I guess, well, I can't watch All Out live because I'm working on the weekend, which is annoying. But that's all right. I can watch All Out when I get home from work in the afternoon. So not the worst thing ever. Uh, UK, NXT UK TakeOver is on when I'm asleep, so I definitely won't be watching that live. Um, so I ain't watching anything live, but I'll certainly be watching them on the weekend. All Out's going to be my priority, of course, as, you know, no one would be surprised about that. But All Out's, you know, really since Double or Nothing, we've had these other kind of shows in between with, for AEW, and they've been, I don't know what, how would you describe them? Um, would they be... B events, just they're not their their marquee pay per views, I guess. I I don't even know how to describe that, but you know what I mean, right? Yeah, they've had sort of a I don't want to say lesser feel, but they definitely haven't felt as big as Double or Nothing. But All Out, just because of the name of it, the name brand, uh, you know, it's when it, when it's falling, where it is, it mm. feels big. Yeah, it does. It, it it definitely feels like on the magnitude of Double or Nothing, and then All In last year. You know, it's been, it's, it's, you know, a year since All In and a year since that kind of, you know, really when I'm, you watched All In, yes, Kevin, we weren't, we yeah. were strangers at that time, but um, I watched All In, you watched All In, and I guess at that time, nobody really predicted where this was going. Sure, there might have been some, you know, some guesses of, hey, maybe this is going to lead to something, but I don't think on the magnitude that we are in right now, I mean, we talked about it last week, Kev. AEW is coming up to television in just a few, in just a month's time. There'll be television for AEW, and they're already talking about video games, and they've got this huge roster, and they've got a lot of dang money behind them, which is important. Um, I don't really think anyone from All In to All Out in this year really, really, really 100% guessed exactly what we're getting right now. It's pretty damn cool when you think about it, but. All Out, of course, is this weekend. We got the, I mean, the main event is, of course, Chris Jericho and Hangman Adam Page for the crowning of the first ever AEW World Champion. Kev, are you excited for that main event? Was that really what you had in mind when you thought the first AEW World Champion? Because it certainly wasn't, for me, that wasn't the match that I had in mind. It it wasn't for me. I definitely thought Kenny Omega would be factoring in there somewhere, but I, I like it because it, it, you have the young gun, Adam Page, fantastically talented, versus the veteran, versus the guy who, you know, you could put the company on his shoulders because he's got so much name brand recognition in Chris Jericho. Yeah. Either one of them could be the first AEW world champion, and it would make sense. Yeah, so definitely. I definitely. I'm interested to see who wins because I, I genuinely don't know how to call it right now. It is hard to call. I mean, if I was in the in the booking reins of um, AEW, I probably would go Chris Jericho, and that's not biasly saying because he's my favorite, but I, I just mean it in the sense of the name value. You said it before. He has name value, I think, and I think it's better to have Hangman chase and Hangman eventually get the championship a little bit later. Putting the... I feel like... But this could be... This could be the you know, the con of this is, is Chris Jericho winning the safe bet? Because you, he's proven, he's got name. I mean, if you put it on Adam Page, it really is, you know, it's crucial that, you know, he succeeds. Because if he doesn't, I mean, you don't want your first world champion, you know, looking like a bozo, I guess. But is Jericho the safe bet? Um, 
Uh, it's tough to say. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd say he is just because of his name brand and he's proven and he's been a world champion. Adam Page has never been a world champion anywhere. Uh, I think the, I think the the highest title he's held was the Ring of Honor Television Championship, huh. and Jericho just you know he you know he could carry a company because he's he's not necessarily carried the WWF in like the early two thousands, but he was definitely a rock and a huge part of their success in the you know two thousand two thousand one range. And I think that he just – I think he just makes sense. You know, I, he could still go. It's not like he's, like, terrible in the ring anymore. Oh, he, no. he could still go. Oh, definitely. Because he's not wrestling. If Jericho was wrestling every single night, Jericho would not be wrestling at the, you know, level he does in this day and age. He's re- he's picking and choosing his time when he's wrestling. I mean, AEW is not something that, you know, is, y- y- you know, on all the time yet. It will be soon, but it isn't yet. So, I mean – it's not like he's wrestling all the time. So Jericho is very uh, uh, what's it, conditioned to the schedule he's on now. So he can kind of go, no pun intended, all out when he needs to. So, I mean, this match is very interesting in so many ways because, A, I don't think a lot of people really expected this match right now or maybe ever or whatever. But at that, that same time... It's interesting in the fact of this is a very different clash of styles. It's not really someone, you know, Jericho would be, you know, Jericho's used to working people like Kenny Omega and, you know, that kind of really high intensity style. Now, I'm not saying Adam Page isn't that high intensity style, but he is certainly a different style of wrestler than, say, a Kenny Omega. He brings a little bit, he brings a little bit of different stuff to the table, yeah. He's. He could go high intensity, but he's more of a you know he's more of a brawler. Yeah, uh, with, mixed in with some high flying. His his shooting star presses are always amazing. I think he's really good at those. Uh, but he's definitely a different opponent than Jericho's ever seen. And yeah, we're used to seeing Jericho work with like the huge names when on on this little uh, trip he's been on since leaving WWE. Adam Page isn't necessarily a step down, but he's a bit more unproven. Yeah, and I mean. You can't really... Jericho doesn't have bad matches. Really. Well, at least in, in today's land, Jericho doesn't have bad matches. Sure, he has okay matches, but everyone he gets in there with, you know, Jericho can bring out the best in you, and I think that's what's going to happen for All Out. I don't think it's going to be the best match on the card. Obviously, there's some other matches that I think have the potential to steal the show, but, I mean, this match is going to be very different to anything on the card. And that's what it makes it a good main event. And that's what makes it a good first match for the world title. But I mean, if I had to venture a guess, I'm going to lock in Jericho. I don't know which way you're going to go, Kevin, but I'm going Jericho. Just for the sake of disagreement and a little bit of a, a sense of competition here, I'm going to go Adam Page. I think that They've been grooming him for a long time to be the first world champion, and I think it's just going to make sense. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I mean, one of us will be wrong, so stay tuned. One of us will be right. One of us will be right. It will be me. Um, Now, the... I mean, let's be honest. But, hey, let's talk about John Moxley. Because, uh, I mean, up until, well, this time last week, he was going one-on-one with Kenny Omega at All Out. Of course, that built since double or nothing when Moxley came in and, you know, shocked the world, I guess, to a sense, and, and announced his position with AEW and attacking Kenny Omega. He's got an elbow injury. That, that elbow has flared up that was he was out for so long for. In, well, how long was he out for in, when he was with WWE with that elbow? That was quite a while, wasn't it? He's out for like eight months or something. Yes, I mean, wrestling at the pace that he's been wrestling lately with uh, the uh, G1 and everything in New Japan and doing all these different shows and stuff like that. I mean, it probably took a toll on him. Well, it obviously did with his elbow now flaring up again. He won't be out for, he said he won't be out for too long, but he's going to miss All Out. We're not getting Omega and Moxley at All Out. We're instead, Kevin, what are we getting? We're getting Omega and Pac. I mean, and as a last-minute substitution, <laughs> you can't get much better than that. You can't really. I mean, in a lot of ways, this will be a 
guaranteed a better wrestling match. Is that fair to say? That might, I don't know if that's right of me to say. Not saying that Moxley's bad, but Moxley has a very different style than Puck. Very different. <laughs> yeah, I I think it'll be a more enjoyable match for fans of pure wrestling. Uh, Pac, I think Pac is just more talented in a certain way than Moxley. If I, I think if we got a Moxley Omega match, it would be, you know, per, it would be personal, you know, blood feud. Yeah. Really, really high intensity. But this is going to be sort of like a – this is going to be a wrestling match. The stakes aren't there, which suck. Uh, you have you don't really have time to build to a match where you just had Pac thrown in like last week, so it doesn't have the same gravity to it as it did with Moxley and Omega because you know the past and they've been building to it on being the elite, but it's still gonna be a dang fun match. Oh yeah, I mean it really will be. I think you're you're hitting the nail right on the head with everything you're saying. I think this Moxley injury, or at least delaying the match between Omega and Moxley is kind of the best thing that could happen because now you have something to build on television because assuming that Moxley's timeline goes all right, he'll be fine for television when it starts on October 2nd. So, I mean, you you have your first, you know, big feud to to promote on television between Moxley and Omega. So that's going to be fun. And eventually when we do get that match, you're right, it'll be a very personal match. This is only going to mean that it's going to get more of a build, so I'm all for it. It'll be fun when it happens. But yes, Puck and Omega is certainly not a bad substitution. It is the best substitution you can get um, for it. I don't really know who goes over. I'd assume Kenny Omega would win here, but I mean, I'm not even really that fussed on the result. Either could go over, and it really wouldn't make that much of a difference for me because I like them both, and we're going to get a really fun match. Yeah, I could t- I could see Pac going over. I I feel like Kenny Omega has been positioned to lose a lot lately. I he lost to Jericho in his last high profile, well, not his last high profile singles match, but he lost to Jericho back at Double or Nothing, which I think was a shock to a lot of people. Yep, <laughs> and I could definitely see him losing this one too. Damn. Well, there you go. Um. A few other things at All Out that are going... We're not going to run down every single match that's happening at All Out, but something I do want to bring up with you is the Casino Battle Royal. The 21-woman Battle Royal, the... They will get a... Is it... They will get a... Whoever wins gets a shot at the women's title. Is that right? I'm... I believe so. Yeah, so there's... Casino Battle Royal. Um, How would you best explain this, Kevin? Because... I get a little bit... I, not that I get lost. I understand the rules. I just can't explain them very well. Well, if it works the same way as the original Casino Battle Royal, it goes like this. There are 21 entrants. You come in in waves of five. The first five come in, then the next five, then the next five, then the next five, until there's 20 people in the ring. And then whoever drew that lucky number 21 gets the... It's like drawing number 30 in the Royal Rumble. Yeah. It's, you have the advantage. Uh, you know, rules are the same as a regular battle royal over the top rope. I don't think there are pinfalls. There might be. No, it's just over the top rope. Um, and I believe, isn't it, is it, so the 21st edge, is that still a thing from the, from the Vegas one that they're going to have like suits and then they come in like, in like hearts, diamonds, clubs, spades, and then... Yeah, I believe, I believe so. I believe so. I think they're rolling with the casino theme. Oh, yeah, the casino battle royal. Um, now, this is for a spot. It is for a spot. I'm looking at it right now on my phone. It is for... So you'll get a spot into the first ever women's championship match. So would it be very simple for us just to say Britt Baker is going to win this? Because she is involved in this. I mean, you've got, like, Britt Baker, Jazz, Jazz is involved in this, which is really cool. Um, it released from Lucha Underground and Tough Enough fame. Um, she was on NXT as well. Was was Ivelisse on NXT? For a bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, she was on NXT. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of women on this. If you want to go and look it up, go and look it up. But would it be easy for us just to say Britt Baker is going to win this? <laughs> It would be easy to say that because I feel like she has to have some sort of place in the first ever women's title match because she was the first women's signee yeah. to the, she the brand. She is the women's division to me. Like, she is that – she is 
the girl of all of the, you know, she is the woman of the women's division. Is that, I guess that's fair to say, but because like you said, she was the first female signee to be announced. So I guess it would be easy for us to say Britt Baker. I would probably put my money on Britt Baker, but I don't know. Maybe there's going to be a... Sh- there's obviously not 21 women women signed to AEW, so there's going to be some surprises in there. Of course, like I mentioned, like Jazz and Ivelisse and stuff like that. Um, Teal Piper's going to be in there, which is really fun. We get to see Roddy Piper's daughter in there. Um, I think Brandy Rhodes has been announced. And, um, yep. Uh, Nyla Rose has been announced. I mean, Britt would be the easy option, but if you're going to say someone other than Britt, do you see someone being a surprise that you're just like, maybe they could really shock us? Because, yes, Britt is the the cornerstone of the women's division, but the women's division outside of Britt doesn't really have like a lot of stars. I mean, we have Awesome Kong and stuff like that, but it's not like she's going to be the centerpiece of the division. No, I have a feeling Awesome Kong's going to be more of a special attraction where she's not going to be there all the time. Yeah. Um, the, the, there, there are a couple names I, I could see. I definitely could see Brandy Rhodes winning um, just because <laughs> she's a Rhodes. I like Brandy Allie. Rhodes. Is that, is that, I like Brandy. I think she's actually like, she, yes, she, she's, she's, a, she's very green in the ring, but I think she has a lot of potential. She's got a great character. She's busted her ass, too. Yeah, like, she's she really, really worked hard to get better in the ring. People hate her. Dude, have you seen some of the shit people write? I mean, shit on Twitter is just what you get. But people really don't like Brandy Rhodes. I mean, I don't really understand it. I like Brandy. <laughs> like I said, I yes, she's a little green. But to your point, she's busted her damn tail to get where she's at right now. People will always hate on a woman in power. She's got a power position in the yeah. company. And yeah. people are always going to say, oh, you only got that because of who you're married to. But I'm pretty sure she has, like, a degree in business and makes sense for the position she holds. So that it's argument is sort of that. It's literally in her name, the chief brandy officer. <laughs> yeah. It makes – yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> It's literally in her name. But other than, you know, you say, like, Brandy. Um, did you mention, like, uh, 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 Allie and stuff like that? Allie, definitely a, a contender in there. They seem to have her well positioned, even though I'm not a huge fan. Me either. Uh, as for a surprise entrance, because there are, I think there's only 10 names announced at this point. Um, yeah, think, Kylie Ray. Kylie oh, yeah, Ray. She, she, she's been hurt, hasn't she? I think so, but what a what a perfect time to make a return. Yeah. Um, could you see some? I don't know. There's not a lot of names that aren't signed up within like the female division. There are other, you know, on uh, Impact or they're obviously with WWE or they're on the AEW roster. So I can't really think of too many ladies that could be in this. I mean, I if I wanted to just say a random guess, could you imagine if number twenty one was Eva Marie? Damn. People would, that would get... fucking go so batshit, like, no thank you. Like, imagine the heat she would have in Chicago. She would have ridiculous heat. I mean, I wouldn't hate it because I never hated Eva Marie. I never did. I always wanted to see what was more with Eva Marie, you know, with that, um, where she wouldn't wrestle every week. I wanted to see where that was going. And then obviously nothing happened and she ended up being released or she saw a contract out. I'm not really sure what happened, but um, imagine Eva Marie. Be that nuts. would be just super nuts. People would hate it. Imagine if Eva Marie was, you know, involved in that. Um, Could you see people like maybe, hmm, I'm trying to really rack my brain here for some people. Um, I, I, Summer Ray? What about Summer Ray? She's from Chicago. Is she really? She, well, she lives in Chicago now. I think she's from North well, Carolina, but she lives in Chicago now. I know that. Um, and she's been mentioning a lot on through interviews and stuff like that that she wants to get back in the ring. I mean, hey. I mean, she has somewhat of a name value. People would know who she is. Yeah. I mean, I can't really think of too many. I would say Tennille Dashwood, but she's been scooped up by Impact. Yeah. I, 
Yeah, she has, and I'm, I'm, I was honestly surprised by that. I thought she'd make a great AEW Me women's too. division competitor, but TNA is or TNA. In fact, I'll be. It's I'll be TNA. It, I mean, it's still TNA to me as well. Yeah, um, they have a really strong women's division, so I'm not. It actually makes sense that she went there, but I, I, I thought we'd see her in AEW. I, I couldn't really even throw out another surprise name outside of Kylie Ray because I like Kylie Ray a lot. Yeah, I don't mind Kylie Ray. I mean, I've only seen very little of her work because. It's not like I'm, you know, out watching a lot of the independent stuff. Well, I am, but not for the, you know, not everything that's on there. So I didn't really see a lot of um, Kylie Ray before AEW. Only, you know, a few little things here and there. But yeah, she'd be fun to make a kind of return. But I guess maybe like Victoria, we could see someone like her in. Um, oh, yeah. Victoria's still wrestling around. So she'd be cool. And obviously she has some, you know. You'd be able to get a nice little pop for for Victoria. So maybe someone like Victoria. I mean, you got Jazz in there. The bitch is back, as she says. Um, I haven't seen Jazz in years. So it'd be cool to see Jazz, but she doesn't have any hair. <laughs> She's I haven't seen Jazz in a while, so I couldn't tell you what she looks like at the stage of the game. <laughs> but um, yeah, that'll be fun. Casino Battle Royal. Um, uh, yeah, Cody and Sean Spears is happening at All Out. That's... Very much got a lot of blad, uh, bad blood going into that. Hey, uh, he just got married, Sean Spears. He did, to Peyton Royce. Lucky man. Yes, he is a very, very lucky man. Um, would there be a word you would use to describe their wedding? Uh, would it be... I, I think you might want to take it, actually, Josh. I believe their wedding would have been iconic. It would have been an iconic wedding, let's just be honest. Um... But so he's been per- from, perfectly iconic, perfectly iconic, wonderful. Uh, so he's gone from wedding to honeymoon to brawling it out with Cody Rhodes this weekend. So he's got a good couple of weeks. Um, you would assume that Cody would be winning here because I don't believe no Cody's lost, but Cody and Sean. I mean, I would like to see Sean Spears win to be completely honest, but I think Cody will probably win this. Nonetheless, it's going to be a very physical match. Yeah, it's going to be a very WWE-style match, um, Mm -hmm. which isn't a bad thing. It's just two guys who are really good WWE competitors working a match. Do you put Cody in that bubble? Um... I, I do. I still. I don't think he's like. I don't think he brings anything to the table outside of not. I don't, I don't want to sound like I, I'm dragging on him because I am, but I don't think he was like a special talent in in ring. Hmm. That's fair. No, I I definitely understand it. Uh, to me, he's. I don't know what I think. If I look at Cody, do I just think you're a WWE guy, or are you not a WWE guy anymore? I mean, Sean Spears is definitely still Ty Dillinger to me because he's it's so fresh. He's still the perfect ten Ty Dillinger, but it's you know it's it's like Moxley. I was calling him Ambrose for so long that I've just you know sometimes I just slip in and call him Dean when his name is John. But I mean, uh, Cody to me he is a very WWE style worker. I think if you put him in WWE, a WWE ring right now, he would just float right back in there. There wouldn't be too much of an adjustment. But that's not a bad thing. We're not saying that anyway. Not that you were saying that that was a bad thing at all, but it is. This is going to be a very... This is a very WWE storyline. Yeah, it's just bad blood between two dudes. It's it's it's, it's pro wrestling 101. Yeah, and it works. It's, this isn't us shitting on it. It just... It works. But I think Cody will win, but I would like Sean to win. But what are your thoughts? I think Cody will win. I, I feel like he just has to win. It just makes sense. You know, you've had this feud for so long since uh, since Fight for the Fallen, and they've been building it up so well on social media because it's really the only way they can build right now is social media, and they've been doing it so well. Yeah, that it feels like they've had a they've had a proper build, even though they haven't had the most conventional build. And yeah. I think it just has to come down to Cody. Yeah, that's fair. 
Um, anything else at all out you're really just pumping to see? There's a triple threat match I'm looking forward to because I think it's going to be violent as all hell between Darby Allen, Joey Janela, and Jimmy Havoc. Oh, yeah. Isn't it the Cracker Barrel Cracker Barrel Clash or something like that they were saying? Yes, the, the Cracker Barrel Clash. <laughs> I, I, I'm looking forward to it even more now that it's been sponsored. <laughs> it's a sponsored match. But I think it's going to be very violent and very fun. Yeah, that will be... Hard hitting would be the words I would use to describe that. It's going to be, uh, yeah, very hard hitting. Uh, that will be fun. Um, I can't think of too much more. My brain's not working, but that I'm really excited for for All Out. But All Out in general will be fun. It's in Chicago, which is always fun. It's fresh. It's new. It's the cool thing on the block. Um, All Out should be a lot of fun. Are you? Overall, I'm assuming you're looking very forward to All Out. Yeah, it's going to be a really good show. You have the Bucks and the Lucha Brothers on there as well oh, for, yeah, the you know, match. Match. Duh. Duh. for the Triple A tag titles. That should be good. I, I don't think there's a bad match on the card right now. Well, there isn't. It's going to be a lot of fun um, just seeing everything kind of take place. And I just want to get to TV. I'm just very eager to get to. I just want to see what AEW on TNT looks like every single week because that's the. That's the real, we can say all these shows have been, well, not all their shows have been A-pluses. I mean, Double or Nothing was an A-plus, and I think All Out's going to be very close to that, if not exceed Double or Nothing. But it's not like Fighter Fest and Fight for the Fallen were the, you know, perfect wrestling shows, but they were certainly not bad. Um, but I think the test is AEW on TNT. We kind of went into, you know, real in-depth on it last week, but th- that's where we're going to see how good AEW really can be. Yeah, it, it you can do all these great shows, and it won't mean anything if you can't deliver when it comes to TV. TV is going to be the huge marker for them to see where they're at. Yeah, you're exactly right, because you look at WWE, and everyone always likes to harp on WWE. They have, you know, really, their pay-per-views are a non-factor. They are very, very good shows all the time. For the most part, their pay-per-views are always good. It's their television where people are kind of um, disinterested. So it could be the same for AEW. We don't know how television is going to look for them, but it's going to be very exciting nonetheless. Um, Speaking of AEW on TNT, Tony Schiavone has been signed to AEW. Now, I don't know the full logistics on whether he's going to be a part of like the commentary team or just the broadcast team in general, but Tony Schiavone is a very underrated voice in, or underappreciated voice in professional wrestling. He was the voice of WCW when it was kicking Raw's ass in the late 90s. I wanted to, so here's a little behind the scenes. I had a little bit of a plan for today's show, and I haven't really opened it up to Kevin because I just want to get his real reaction to some things. And, you know, we've been talking now for, it feels like years, but we've been talking for, what, nine, ten months almost going into, you know, the next couple of months. We, we're coming on the back end of a year that we've kind of been going at it for reverb every week. Now, we've never really, we've talked a lot about commentary and we've talked a lot about, obviously, the in-ring product, but... You know, speaking of, like, broadcast teams and stuff like that, we never really talk about great announcers, great backstage interviewers and stuff like that because it's, you know, it's probably pretty fair to say that it's it's an underappreciated role in wrestling, a backstage interviewer or an announcer. What do you think, without going into someone that you love, because I'll get to that in a minute, but the role of a backstage interviewer and, a, and an announcer... Um, what do you think their role is in the importance to a professional wrestling show? I think it's critical because you have good backstage announcers and bad backstage announcers and you you want to remember them because you, you don't want them to take over the segment because you want the segment to be about the wrestler, but you also want them to have some personality to them. And my personal favorite backstage announcer definitely had that. I'll get to him in a minute. But and I, I I wouldn't be surprised if our answers um lined up. But you have to have someone who can find that line between adding to the segment without taking it over. Yeah, because you want it still to be about 
the you know the subject matter which is the star or stars that they're interviewing because you don't want the interviewer to be more over than the actual stars because you know you just don't want that but when we talk about we'll talk about announcers in a minute in the in terms of you know people that do the introducing of of talent but backstage interviewers go ahead and tell me your personal favorite and see if they match up it's got to be me and Gene. Me and Gene Okerlund was was just the best at it. He was a character. He you knew who he was. You knew he was. He had a really good. His voice was great. His cadence was terrific. His delivery was on point, and he he knew how to mix it up with the superstars in a way that you know you still remember who he was interviewing, but you're also like, oh, you look forward to a Mean Gene interview. Yeah, I mean, it's hard not to say Mean Gene. He's the kind of staple for what. Um, a backstage interviewer should be. He was fun. He was charismatic. He still let the he still let the talent shine, but didn't dim his own light because of it. But the evolution of a backstage interviewer we've gone we've we've seen so many. Look at all like Coach was a backstage interviewer. Michael Cole, Lillian Garcia, Renee Young. Um, uh, we've had Maria Kanellis was a backstage interviewer. Terry Runnels. And they all, you know, formed into other aspects of the business and became great in their roles, you know, um, separately in other things. But Mean Gene was one that was kind of, I mean, he did a few other things, but he was at his core a a backstage interviewer. He is widely renowned as the greatest of all time in that, in that, um, in that role. But when you think of like the modern backstage interviewer it seems to be there's especially in wwe land it's a very cookie cutter structured segment they all kind of not that they're not showing personality i think really the last one to show a lot of personality was renee young renee young seemed to have her own little itch when it comes she's very good at backstage interviewing and it is her um you know her cup of tea is just She's a backstage interviewer. She's a host. She, she she was very good at that. And a lot of people were saying that she was probably the best since Mean Gene, just in not comparing them to at all because he's very different to Renee. But I think she was the last really, like, one to show a lot of personality because you, sh- you look at the ones they have now, like the Kathy Kellys, the um, Kayla Braxtons, um, Dasha Fuentes was there. You know, she's now not, no longer with WWE. But it seems to be that it is very structured, yeah, and it seems like a lot of them are just like the same. They they they, they feel the same. The Charlie Caruso's and oh, yeah, the Charlie, yeah, the Kaylee, the Kayla Braxtons and the Kathy Kellys. Kathy Kelly, I I I I'm not as familiar with because she's an NX. She's more NXT, and I don't watch NXT as much. But like in terms of Charlie, Kayla, and Sarah Schreiber, they they all feel very much the same. To me, because they're just asking questions. They're not like they're not characters. They're actual legitimate backstage interviewers, which is fine. But I, I do like a little bit of spiciness to my uh, to my interviewer. You know, I like I like a little give and take back there, especially when you're interviewing like a heel. I like you know yeah. I like there to be some sort of rapport. And I think Renee Young was very good at that. Am, am I am I just a fanboy of Renee Young, or was she good at that? <laughs> No, she was just good at that. You are yeah. also just a fanboy of Renee Young, though. I mean, I'm not going to deny that because I am. Because <laughs> but um, she was very good at that. I think they've tried to... I think Charlie's kind of taken Renee Young's role, but it hasn't... It's just not the same. I don't know. Something's... There's some kind of missing... You know, something's missing. But I think it's more of the WWE structure when you look at those ladies doing that now. They are all... Yeah, and, there's and no, there's Charlie... No bias. Has done a good, had did a good job hosting the NXT Takeover. She or she does. Yeah, she, she hosts does. Takeover pre-shows. She at one point hosted the main roster pre-shows before they gave it over to Coach, who's terrible at them. Which he should not be terrible at them because he works for ESPN and that's literally his job is to host a television show, and he just can't do it on there. It's like they lost Renee, who was very Renee Young was very good at again. She's very good at being a host. Um, and then it kind of went to Charlie, who is also very good at it. And then it went to Coach, who's no offense to Coach, but he's just not good at it. <laughs> yeah, no one likes Coach. No, 
No one, I mean, I yeah. liked Coach back in the day when he was like getting his ass kicked and he was with Eric Bischoff, but that's a different story for a different day. Yeah, when he was the coach, now he's Jonathan Coachman. And he's boring. And he's, he is, and he's not, you know, he's just not fun. Yeah, and I mean, Charlie is good at them, but I mean, it's just, it is, it is, like I've said before, like I said earlier, it's just very structured with the way they do things with backstage interviewers and stuff like that. It doesn't seem like a lot of them have personality. I know Maria Kanellis was a little bit different because she was literally playing a character within the show, but she wasn't meant to be a good backstage interviewer, but hey, at least it added something to the interview without taking away too much from the star. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, Maria was good at, you know, having her own character and doing her own thing and making sure she stayed relevant without taking away from the star she was interviewing. She often made it very entertaining back there. Yeah, she did because she was just the dumb girl. She was just, that was her, that was her shtick and she played it well. Um, but, you know, Maria, who are some other earlier ones that we're probably forgetting there's, there's, oh, um, I don't know. there's been so I many. Don't know. There's been so many and uh, like backstage interviewers. Um, now on the flip side of things with announcers, you know, you think of great announcers like Howard Finkel and, and etc. Um, to me, the iconic wrestling voice what I grew up with announcing was Lillian Garcia. Now I don't think she's the greatest of all time. It probably is Fink, but Lillian to me is that she sounds like. Raw. She sounds like wrestling. Yeah, I was I was gonna say the same thing. For me, it, it's Lillian Garcia is the voice of Raw, and Tony Kimmel is the voice of SmackDown. Oh yes, oh yes. Um, oh, man, the way he says "rated R superstar." I the rated R superstar. You got there. Good, good work. Did you sit on your balls to do that, or? <laughs> Oh my god, no. I just have a, I just have a great range. Oh, okay. My my bad. Maestro over here. Yeah. I am. I'm, I'm a I'm a core, I'm a, I'm a singer. <laughs> but yeah, Lillian is the voice, but I think Fink is probably renowned as the greatest of all time. There's there's obviously some others. Justin Roberts is very good, but he has I don't know, there's something about Justin Roberts that's like, he's good, but he's always the same. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I like Justin Roberts, and I think he's very good, and I don't have a problem with him, but he's just, he, like, he, he's just a different, I don't know, just a different kind of guy. He doesn't represent a show the way Kimmel and Garcia yeah. did. Yeah, um, that that is very true. Greg Hamilton, who's on SmackDown, for anyone that doesn't know, he's very good. I like Greg Hamilton. He was great. In I like him, and, uh, and I like Mike Rome. You like Mike Rome? Eh. Yeah, I don't have a problem with Mike Rome. I feel like he's... I, he, he sort of blends in for me, though. Like Hamilton, I think, stands out a bit more. Yeah, and I feel like Mike Rome is almost Greg Hamilton 2.0. <laughs> that's true. Of... That's actually a very that's actually a very fair assessment. They're very similar, but like Greg Hamilton does it better. Greg Hamilton, and he's had... got his own personal. You know, he's got his own thing, like with. Kimmel, it was Edge, the rated R superstar, and for Greg Hamilton, it's the best in the world, Shane McMahon. Ah, I was wondering where you're going with that then, but yeah, he does. And has anyone ever watched the Greg Hamilton mockumentary they did on the WWE's YouTube channel? Because it's yes, fucking it was, hilarious. It was, it was very funny. Oh my god, it was so hilarious. But yeah, Greg Hamilton's very good, but yeah, Lillian's probably the one that I think, I mean, I don't really... How do you feel about JoJo? I mean, she's not really there anymore, I guess. I guess. I don't yeah, know I don't know where. Gonna, I mean, she, she had, had a baby. baby. Yeah, with the fiend. But, uh, <laughs> the, yeah, what a what a weird duo that is, yeah, that JoJo. Is... But, um, I don't know. She was never really my favorite. No, she never really made like a uh an, an impact on me. No, she never really was one that was like fantastic i mean there's been there hasn't been really that many over the course of the time we've been watching wrestling because for so long it was lillian garcia and tony chimmel they were the two ones that were kind of the staples i guess for a long time and then you know there's been a little bit of a change up recently with some newer ones but the girl on nxt i honestly don't know her name the girl on nxt she did the last couple of takeovers or at least the last takeover she is not great (laughs) I couldn't even tell you, so that's probably not a good sign. 
Yeah. But, um, yeah, announcers and stuff like that, they do play... Announcers and backstage interviews and stuff, they do play a very underappreciated ro- role. They add to a show. I mean, if you've got a bad announcer, you know, calling the show, it can take away from from the atmosphere of the the night, I guess, in a lot of ways. Maybe it's not make or break, but they do play... They play a definitely an important role within the show, and there is a lot of room for improvement in WWE land, I think. Not maybe announcers, but backstage interviewers. I wish it was less structured. I guess that's the best way of putting it. Yeah, we're waiting for the next big breakout star backstage. Yeah. It'll happen one day and we won't even realize it and we'll be like, hey, this person is very good at what they do. Um, You know, the other, the other part of the broadcasting team is, of course, commentary. And, I mean, people have opinions on, on commentary, especially in this day and age with whoever it is, whatever company or, you know, whether it's AEW or WWE or whatever, um, commentary plays a very big role. I mean, I hear commentary. Some people don't. I mean, I believe you've said to me before, Kevin, that you don't really pay that much attention to commentary. I don't. Only when it's bad. Fair. I hear it. I mean, I I, I can tune it out, but I hear it. But I don't don't think there's that much of a problem. I don't think there's as much of a problem as people say, especially on WWE's television with commentary now. I don't really think there is. I know a lot of people harp on um, the fact that they're probably talking about something else or whether this person's bad at commentary or not. I mean, we know the kind of situation with Renee and a lot of people don't like Graves or Byron Saxton or David Otunga or whoever. But, I mean, I don't really think there's that much of a problem with commentary, but... A lot of people seem to think there is still. Yeah, a lot of people have problems with Cole and Renee. Uh, Corey is pretty much universally liked, I'd say. I think Corey's good. But Cole and Cole... Vic Joseph is a fantastic commentator. He's probably my favorite play-by-play guy. I like like Vic from what I've heard of him on 205 and on NXT UK. Yeah. And he was on Raw a couple of weeks ago, and Michael Cole kind of let Vic do the main play by play by play commentary, and it was very good. So that's a good sign. But um, yeah, I like Vic. But go on, I cut you off. Oh, what the hell was I gonna say? Oh, when Cole's not doing his damn catchphrases, he's <laughs> he's fine. <laughs> hey, he, boy, you don't like the big dog, or here comes the man, or it's boss time. You don't like that? <laughs> no, because he just not leans on them too much, and they're so bad. Yeah, he does. He really he really accentuates them where, to the point where he just milks them dry and you're like, "Fuck me." Well, like he's almost he's almost become a parody of himself with that, which I, really I, I kind of think is funny. Yeah, in a lot of ways. But I, I, people seem to hate Michael Cole, but I, Michael Cole is a very good commentator and he ho- holds a lot of things together which people don't realize. He brings a sense of legitimacy. Like he's a broadcast he's he is a broadcast journalist and not just a wrestling commentator in my opinion. And he's a veteran of the business. He's been there a lot longer than a, most of the talent. <laughs> yeah. When you really he's think about it. <laughs> some years? Yeah, I mean, I believe he made his debut on WWE TV in 1998. 97 yeah. even. So he's been there for what? That's what, 22 years. 21, 22 years. That's I, just, I just remember when he had like the frosted hair. Oh, yeah. And he was a backstage interviewer. Yes. He was a backstage interviewer, and he used to get, like, I don't know, people used to pick on him, especially The Rock. The Rock used to pick yeah, on him. Yeah, and that's what, makes, that's what made him good, is that, like, he was able to have that back and forth with people, because yeah. maybe they were making fun of his hair, maybe they were making fun of how short he is. Yeah, hey. And, then, and now he's evolved into one of, and people are going to be like, eh, Josh, you're wrong. One of, if not one, if not the greatest play-by-play commentator of all time. In some people's minds, he probably is the greatest of all time. In some yeah, people's minds, maybe not in ours, but in some people's minds, I'm sure he is. He's he's, oh, I'm up, sure he's up I'm there. Sure there's, I'm sure there's some wrong people out there. Yeah. Do you think? What do you think? Jim Ross is the greatest of all time. I, I mean, I love Jim Ross. I think the I think my favorite commentary team, just from watching them on the network, is Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan. 
I mean, I haven't watched enough of that to even comment, but I mean, I know Bobby Heen and stuff. I mean, but yeah. Jim Ross is great once upon a time. He's not great anymore. Just, I'm going to be completely honest. I don't think Jim Ross is great anymore. I don't think, I I think AEW should be careful with the way they're leaning on old broadcasters like JR and now Tony Schiavone. I think they have a good thing going with Golden Boy and Excalibur. Yep. I agree. And that's what they should stick with. I don't think they need JR. Yeah, JR sounds like he's reading off a piece of paper these days. He doesn't sound like he has any real emotion. Yeah, he doesn't have the same passion for the business as he once did. He's still a great wrestling mind. They could use him in the boardroom. They could use him upstairs. And he could still be a special guest, kind of, you know, commentates here and there for some, you know, matches and it wouldn't be as bad as... Well, not that he's... He's not bad. He just sounds disinterested. And he's an older yeah, dude. Like, like, let the dude just chill. <laughs> yeah. Like, when WWE used to try him out for, like, you know, Undertaker versus Triple H, Hell in a Cell, or Undertaker's last match, or Bait uh, Dunn from NXT TakeOver Chicago, it felt... It made it feel more important. Having him on, like, everything, calling, like, even, like, the weaker matches just doesn't make it feel important anymore. Yeah, I agree with you completely. Ross used to be really great, and he's a shell of himself now. But um, Tony Schiavone is, a, I said this at the, kind of earlier, he is a very underrated member of that group of people. In in the sense of, like, no one talks about him being as... He was very great in his time. I know you didn't really... You have watched WCW, but it's not like you were watching. No, neither was I, but I've watched a lot of WCW, and especially appreciating wrestling as I do now, when I hear his voice, I'm like, wow, he was very good at, he was a very good announcer. And I don't think, I don't know. Do we not hear him in the conversation of one of the greatest? Is that not a thing? You'll never, you you don't hear his name because he worked for a company that went out of business. People look at, Mm. people just look at WWE commentators, really. That's true. You're not, you're not honestly uh, wrong. No one talks about Don, where uh, Mike Tanay as a great commentator, even though I think he's very good because he worked for TNA for all the and WCW for all those years. Yeah, Mike Tanay's pretty great. He was the voice of Impact. Yeah, I think Impact he was. Great, the show. I loved his voice. Yeah, Mike Tanay's very good. Um, I couldn't I even know. tell you who commentates on Impact now. Uh, Josh Matthews. Ugh. Yeah, I'm Spew. good. I'll pass on that. I do. What, I do think Don Callis is there now, which is which. I like Don Callis, but I hate Josh Matthews. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. I'm not a fan of Josh Matthews. Never was. And same, 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 same. The only time that I ever found him somewhat entertaining was when him and Mark Cole were in NXT season three, and they were, it was just a joke. But he wasn't. Michael Cole was the funny one with the gong, you know. I mean, if you're in the room and Michael Cole's funnier than you, it's probably not a great thing. Although, I yeah, mean, Michael Cole terrible. as a heel. I mean, Michael Cole as a heel was pretty funny. When he had that coal mine. Oh, the that? coal mine? Coal miners? That was incredible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all right. I'm not going to completely hate on, on Michael Cole. I mean, I never do, but I'll hate on his catchphrases like you. But, hey, bring back the coal mine. Why not? Let's Honestly, heal give them Michael a- Cole again. Nice. Where he just hates Daniel yep. Bryan. <laughs> yeah, calls him a, he, that that nerd. <laughs> and he loved the Miz. Oh my god. Oh, he was in love with the Miz. <laughs> oh my god, you didn't just hear Michael Cole go crazy when the Miz came out, and now Miz is a face and Bryan's a heel. So, <laughs> my how the turntables have turned. <laughs> it uh, it is a. Uh... I was actually thinking about, you know, when I was watching Raw and SmackDown this week, I was like, man, the Miz face turn was so due, and everyone was like, yes, I'm ready for the Miz to be a face, and then it happened, and he worked with Shane, and now I'm like, I want the Miz to be a heel again, because he's just, like, so bland as a baby face. <laughs> he's always been. It, it. I don't know why we really wanted him to turn. I liked him working as a heel that just got cheered. Yeah, I mean, as soon as you turn someone that's getting cheered as a heel, that's the end of them getting cheered in a lot of ways. 
Yeah, because they're taking away the best part of him. It doesn't help that he lost a feud to Shane McMahon. Yeah, but... he lost all of those matches, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he Rough. did. And everyone thought that was like a guaranteed win for Miz at Mania, and it just didn't happen. What well, I mean... I know. They thought they were getting... They, they got a little too cute with that finish. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Poor Miz. And now I guess he's working with Shinsuke Nakamura, who's with Sami Zayn now. Which is an interesting pairing. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm digging it. I am too. I mean, I was surprised because I was like, okay. But, I mean, basically, Sami Zayn just like climaxes to Kinshasa's, which, I mean, who doesn't? Yeah, honest to God, who doesn't? What a finishing move. Yeah, I mean, so that's I guess that's the shtick now, and I'm I'm with it, and it, I'm happy because Shinsuke is finally getting some. I mean, not that he needed someone to talk for him because I don't think his English is that bad, but I mean, if you're going to stick him with anyone who's really great on the microphone, who's a really great heel, it's probably Sami Zayn. And it's crazy to think about how great Sami Zayn is as a heel because he was such a great baby face when he came yeah. in. I mean, the same can be said about feet. Daniel Bryan. Also, very true. Very good heel. He's a fantastic heel. If you, um, for anyone that caught SmackDown this week and he was like slapping the hell out of Eric Rowan, who is Eric Rowan again? By the way, just putting it out there, he's Eric Rowan again. He's not just Rowan anymore. It's on the yes, WWE.com they put, they page. Put that Eric back on his name. Is that because it sounded too much like Roman? Is they, did they, like, Rowan, Roman, it's like very, po- it's very possible. And because Brian's going to be working with Roman, obviously, um, you know, so maybe they changed it back to that. But regardless, Brian's promo was very great. He's very good at playing a kind of low key, kind of crazy heel. He's kind of a little bit crazy. <laughs> he's he's deranged. Yeah, deranged is a great word. And he's just, did you see, did, did you happen to see that sloth shirt he was wearing on SmackDown? It was beautiful. He was wearing this, he was wearing this like hoodie and then this black sloth shirt. It was just the sloth being a sloth. And I was like, wow, I want that. And he was yelling at Roman Reigns and then got speared. I mean, I guess that's what happens. I didn't, I, I only watched Raw. I didn't get to watch SmackDown. Give me your thoughts. Raw was, um, okay, I want to break something down with you because I know your opinion on this will probably be similar to mine. Everyone was going on about this Sasha Banks promo at the start of Raw. Everyone was like, listen to Sasha's pipe bomb. Sasha Banks reads promos. She reads them like she's reading a script. I, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way because I'm a fan of Banks, but to me, she sounds like she's reading off a piece of paper. It was a fine promo. It wasn't like anything world beating. I didn't think it was like the craziest thing ever. It just sounded like to me. I don't. I, everyone was calling it a pipe bomb. I'm like, it definitely was not a pipe bomb. No. She was just. We use the term pipe bomb too liberally now. I agree completely, one hundred percent. But it was fine. I'm not saying reading off a script is a bad thing. It's just it was it was fine. It was much. It was um, nice to see Sasha in the ring as a heel again. I'll give you that. She wrestles better as a heel than a face because she doesn't have to be yeah. flashy. And she wrestles better when she's controlling the pace of a match. It just, I just, we talked about that a little while ago with Carmella being a better heel character, but a better in ring worker as a face. With Sasha, it's she's a better heel, period. <laughs> yeah, she just is a better bad woman. Yeah. She is, and the boss is back, which is nice. Like, that character does not work as a face because the boss is being in charge and being that bitch, as we said last week. Yes. That title of that podcast got so over, by the way. I don't know why. (laughs) Sasha Banks took a DNA test and found out that she is, once again, 100% that bitch. Oh, yeah. I'm back at it again with the zings. Um... Other than that on Raw, there wasn't... How are you feeling about Braun Strowman and Seth Rollins being tag team champions and, I mean, having a universal championship match? I'm kind of... I don't know how to feel about Rollins I don't like Strowman. it. You don't like it? I don't it? like it. Not really. I mean, Rollins and Strowman isn't a match that really appeals to me. 
Me I don't see Strowman winning. Me either. <laughs> to be completely honest, me either. <laughs> I don't think Strowman will ever win the world title. Whoa, that is a hot take. Damn. Is it really? I don't, I don't think he'll ever win a world title. Huh. I don't think he'll never ever win a world title. I think he'll get it one day, but I don't think Clash of Champions is the place for it. But, um, okay. I mean, it's fair. I mean, I'm not going to debate it, but, I mean, it's just a bit of a hot take. Well, I think it is. Maybe it's not. Huh. Maybe it is. I, I, didn't, I didn't think it was that hot a take. Oh, well. Maybe it's a maybe it's a lukewarm take. Who knows? Um, maybe it's an Omega lukewarm take. No, oh, shout out to Omega Luke. What a dude. Um, there was something else I was going to bring up and I can't remember. Oh, Ziggler and Rude. Robert Rude and Dolph Ziggler and Ziggler. Now- Ziggler, my new favorite tag team. Or Rudolph. Um, let's break this down because. I have an opinion on this that obviously a lot of the internet didn't agree with in the fact of everyone was mad because they weren't a quote-unquote real tag team and they beat all these quote-unquote real tag teams. Now, in my world, every tag team has to start somewhere. And I guess this is just their start. And I guess if you want to form a new tag team, beating tag teams is probably the way to go. Now, you may not agree with me, but... I don't have a problem with them. Do you? No. Maybe this is the shot of life the tag team division needed because it was sorely lacking any real heat or any real direction. Yeah. I mean, look at look at who your your tag champs are two dudes who are feuding with each other. That's never a great thing. I'm not saying that the OC having them, Allos, uh, Allos, Anderson and Gallows having the titles was a bad thing, but who were they going to work? What, yeah, what now actually. You- now you have a brand new team, uh, two good workers. They're going to put on good matches. They're going to put on fun matches. I love Bobby Roode and I love Dolph Ziggler. Who? 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 You mean Robert Roode, don't you? Oh, whatever, man. <laughs> but Actually, hey. no, 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 no. You're right. You're right. Put some respect on his name. Robert Roode. Robert Roode, and I'm glad to see Robert Roode doing something, because he hadn't been doing anything ever. He is too damn valuable to be left off TV. And it gives something for Dolph to do, because Dolph has been, you know, and coming off of Dolph working with Goldberg, so, I mean, it ain't a bad deal, and they're definitely probably going to beat Rollins and Strowman at Clash of Champions, so they're going to take the tag titles to other teams, and working with people like Dolph Ziggler and um, Robert Roode is not a bad thing in the slightest. No, two, Dolph... vet- two veterans of the business. Yeah, Dolph's had tag team titles with a few different... Look at him and McIntyre last year. They were a great team. And yeah. they're an unexpected great team. And they worked with the Shield of all teams. So, I mean, you look at this in a year and it's like weird. But I have absolutely no problem with them being a team. Absolutely no problem. Um, well, we're wrapping things up. I was going to talk about something else, but we can leave that to a later date. I won't even fill you in on what, I was, what it was going to be, but we'll, we'll, trust me. It's probably enough for a full episode, to be completely honest. So we'll leave oh, it shit. at that. But, um, you know, I'm excited for All Out. I'm excited for where we're going with that. I'm just, you know, I'm just riding this train out for as long as I can, really. I'm just happy to be watching wrestling at the moment, to be honest. I've had a bit of a shitty couple of weeks, which I'm not going to even bother to get into, but um, wrestling is very important to me, and it helps a lot. So, in shitty times, wrestling is there, so just, you know, keep that in mind. Also, before we actually go, I watched half of SmackDown with my mum this week, and it was interesting. She had some opinions. She wasn't here for the whole episode, but... She was wearing some weird shit. She was like, why is the Australian boy named after a dog? Her, in her <laughs> mind, Buddy Murphy, I guess. And I was like, this is what you're talking about. She liked Randy when Randy Orton better when he wore purple trunks. And I guess that means she liked him better in 2004. Which, I mean, is a hot take, but also I kind of agree. Um, the legend funny. killer. The legend. She, she used to watch, obviously I used to watch wrestling Every single, you know, I used to watch Raw every week, and obviously my mum's going to be around at some point. My mum used to be terrified of Kane. 
Like, terrifying That's fair. Kane, Kane was a terrifying character. My sister used to be in love with Kane when he wore a mask. That's fucking Kane weird. Kane was a very lovable character as well. <laughs> My sister, who is, was probably five, six at the time, was in love with Kane. Let's just... That's weird. But hey, whatever. I loved, I loved my Kane action figure. I had a Kane action figure and I bit his glove off when I was a kid. Like I bit Oh, it. wow. I, I was a biter as a kid. We'll get into that. Clearly. The day. Yeah, I was a biter. I used to bite other people. Um, but I don't do it anymore that I can recall. You sure? Well, I mean, as, as a 23-year-old man, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be biting anyone. Well, man is a very debatable topic for me, but let's not get into that either. Let's take this home. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening, morning, night, midday, wherever it is, whatever time you're listening to this to. Um, you know what? I would say that listening to this show at like 4 a.m. would be perfect because you could be kind of delusional and tired, and that's the best time to listen to us, I think, because no matter what in our time zones, one of us is always delirious. So We're that. a fever dream. Eh, yeah. Eh, anyway, make sure to rate this podcast five stars on iTunes. Check out everything on Brain Buster Radio. Make sure to check out all the stuff I have going on. Um, you'll see the links for our Twitters in the description. Make sure to check out the Josh Robinson show every single Tuesday. It is now a video cast as well. So make sure to check out that because now you can not only hear me, you can see me, but that's every single Tuesday until next time. Have a lovely day. Goodbye, everyone.